This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. Flapper dresses, jazz music, and the introduction of talkies. These are just some of the things we know the Roaring Twenties best for. But in one of the world's most prosperous decades, underneath the glitz and glamour, there lies countless unsolved mysteries. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two bizarre cases of people who vanished in the 1920s. But first, I'd like to thank Hunt a Killer for sponsoring today's episode. If there's something undeniable about the warm summer months, it's that there is no better time to gather around with friends, enjoying each other's company and the fine weather. But perhaps this time, you want to bring something a little different to the time spent with others. Luckily, we've solved the mystery with a game of goosebumps that will add intrigue to any knight's itinerary in the made-for-adventure masterpiece, Hunt a Killer. In this subscription-based interactive game of sleuthing, you'll receive regular monthly deliveries with new cases to crack each time. Every box includes a unique mystery, sucking you into a world of clever clues, mind-bending puzzles, and the chance to finally solve that murder, keeping you up at night. With banks of evidence and audio resources provided for you, organized in a package that's easy to take on the road, be it to a friend's party, a gathering, or even on holiday. And if in-depth storytelling is more of your vibe, each case dives deep into its own original characters with intriguing backgrounds, assembling a detailed narrative that's more than just a bloody crime scene. And whether you take on the hunt by yourself, like the hard-boiled private eye, or with a crew of crafty friends, Hunt a Killer can bring people together for the perfectly satisfying Cabin in the Woods experience. Not only that, but we've personally found the game to be more engaging than your everyday true crime documentary or blockbuster film. As you know, we at Cold Case Detective want to make you, the viewer, feel like an integral part of the cases we cover. And this game does that and more. It makes you the Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie. We haven't received a box that didn't disappoint, and we know it will be perfect for our passionate, sleuthing audience. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to hunterkiller.com slash coldcasedetective and use the code coldcasedetective for 20% off your first box. Again, use the code coldcasedetective, all caps, for a 20% discount and show your support for the channel. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Marvin Clark. Now well known for being the oldest active missing persons case in the United States, Marvin Clark was not a stranger in his hometown of Teagard, Washington County, Portland. Popular and well-liked, Marvin continued to live a rich and fulfilling life. Born sometime in 1852 in Marion County, Iowa, he had several jobs over the years, working as both a farmer and a town marshal where specifically, he worked as a sheriff. This latter career is what added to his family's concern when he vanished in the 1920s. On October 30th of 1926, at around 1 p.m., Marvin left his home. It is unclear why exactly he did this and what means of travel he used, as sources on the 75-year-old's case differ. In one version, Marvin left to visit his daughter who'd recently moved from Washington to Portland. In another version of the tale, he was reportedly traveling to a dentist appointment via stagecoach. The last confirmed sighting of the retired sheriff was at a bus terminal on Yamhill Street in downtown Portland. He was dressed in a dark suit jacket and trousers. Mentally, Martin's loved ones believed he was in perfect shape. Although he was getting on in life, he had not shown any signs of dementia 
or memory loss. Physically, however, he had his fair share of issues. Namely, he could not use his right arm due to paralysis, and he walked with a limp, which was described by newspapers at the time as a hanging gait. Marvin never made the 10-mile trip to his daughter's home. His wife, Mary, discovered this when she contacted Sydney only to find out that she hadn't seen her father. Worse yet, Sydney hadn't been expecting him. He had visited during the week prior to his disappearance. While Mary filed a missing persons report, Sydney offered a $100 reward for any information which would lead to her father's whereabouts, the modern equivalent of around $1,455. No sign of the 75-year-old was ever traced. Witness sightings of him in the local area were non-existent in Portland after the time he was seen on Yamhill Street. Then, just over a week later, on November 9th, it was reported by a newspaper in Bellingham, Washington, that Mary had received a postcard believed to be written by her husband. The newspapers described the note as disconnected, saying, the letter indicated that the aged man's mind is wandering and it was badly jumbled, despite the fact that Clark is highly educated, being a graduate of two universities. The postcard was postmarked in Bellingham, and it was soon discovered that several witnesses had seen the retired sheriff in that area, specifically in two hotels on the 2nd and 3rd of November. Reportedly, Marvin had very little money on him at the time of his disappearance. If he truly was the man these people saw, it is unclear how exactly he paid for his hotel stays. The man in Washington was never tracked down, and leads in Marvin's case quickly dried up. The Clark family did not believe that Marvin would have taken his own life, but did, for a time, worry that perhaps he'd become the victim of someone whom he'd had dealings with during his time as a sheriff, perhaps someone who wanted revenge. They also wondered if he'd suddenly become disoriented and gotten lost somewhere, his body never found. Online sleuths have noted that, since Sydney used to live in Washington, perhaps Marvin was suffering from dementia or confusion and had gone there to visit her. In 1986, around 60 years after Marvin's disappearance, the skeletal remains of a man were found by loggers in a wooded area between Teagood and Portland. The skeleton, which was almost complete, had no identification, but was accompanied by numerous distinctive items, including an 1888 Liberty Head nickel, a 1919 penny, a pocket watch, a pair of leather shoes, a pair of wire-rimmed glasses, a fraternal Order of Eagles pocket knife, and finally, four tokens inscribed with D and P. The tokens are thought to have been those awarded in card games, which allowed the carrier to buy food and booze from specific pubs. Investigators also discovered a rusted 38 revolver and one spent shell. The skeleton's autopsy revealed that John Doe had a bullet hole in his skull. His death was ruled as suicide, and he was likely between the ages of 35 and 55. Despite being at least 20 years younger than Marvin Clark, his family wondered if this is what had become of him. Marvin's granddaughter came forward to tell the police about her suspicions. According to one article, she told them her grandfather sometimes walked with a cane and that he had become depressed in the years before his vanishing because of his medical problems. At this time, a definitive link between John Doe and Marvin Clark could not be made. Sadly, his granddaughter Dorothy passed away just five years later, in 1991, without leaving any DNA for future testing. It wasn't until 2011 that the case was re-examined again. Dr. Nikki Vance, who is currently the state forensic anthropologist at the Oregon State Police Department, looked at Marvin's case file and took John Doe's remains from storage, hoping to close the lead once and for all. Forensic pathologists managed to get DNA from John Doe's remains, but the case grew quiet again for a few years, until 2014, when medical examiners explained they were unable to locate maternal descendants of Marvin's so that they could make a positive ID. They told the Digital Journal that they required someone on his mother's side, saying, quote, there is an association there, but it's not strong 
at this point. In 2018, Marvin's great, great, great granddaughter came forward, providing the authorities with her DNA alongside her sons. The samples were sent off to the University of North Texas, who managed to determine that John Doe was not Marvin Clark. Marvin Clark has still never been found, and John Doe is still unidentified. Marvin's great-great-great-granddaughter's DNA, along with her son's, are still on file. They hope that one day they will find his remains and be able to finally bring the case to a close. If you have any information about Marvin Clark's whereabouts or the identity of John Doe, please contact the relevant authorities on 503-988-4300. Alice Corbett Born sometime in 1906 in Utica, New York, very little is known about the early life of Alice M. Corbett. In 1925, she was 19 years old and attending Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. The establishment was a private liberal arts college for women, and Alice was in her junior year, and was, by all accounts, doing well at the university. Early on, in the morning of November 13th, 1925, a fellow student and friend of Alice's, named Jean Robson, was found dead in her dorm room due to an accidental asphyxiation by illuminating gas. It is unclear if the pair lived near each other, as theories by online sleuths suggest that perhaps Alice was also affected by this gas, or was simply shocked by what happened and suffered a mental break. Alice was last seen at around 8 a.m., leaving her room in the Clark House dormitory. However, she never returned that evening, prompting friends to enter her room and investigate. It was here they found an unsealed letter addressed to her mother. Among other things, the note included the line, Mother, I am going home. College officials, who examined the letter when Alice's friends brought it to them, noted that it included content which indicated that the 19-year-old was in a confused state of mind at the time of her leaving. Her father, James Corbett, took the letter to a doctor who agreed with this hypothesis. He determined Alice may have been suffering from mental health problems when she left the dorm that morning. At the time of her vanishing, Alice had a boyfriend, a young man named Thomas Sterling, who attended the nearby Amherst College. Authorities discovered letters between the two in her room. Upon speaking with him, Thomas told police that his girlfriend had asked him to buy her a bottle of poison in the week before she disappeared. He refused. The letters between the two were studied further, and it turned out the couple had fought recently. It is unclear if the pair had fought because Thomas declined to buy the poison. Whatever the case may be, Thomas was ruled out as a suspect in December of 1925. Although staff and students helped the police to search the campus, no sign of Alice was ever found. The day following her vanishing, Massachusetts State Police and the local Boy Scouts carried out ground searches in the area. Meanwhile, her father, James, posted a $500 reward for information leading to her whereabouts, and local radio stations broadcast her description. Alice was last seen wearing a dark dress, small brown hat, red belt, and a waterproof yellow rain jacket. She was believed to have been carrying around $75 in cash. Slowly, witness reports began to trickle in. One man believed that he had seen her that morning when she had inquired about the local trolley bus schedule. However, trolley crews themselves stated that no woman resembling Alice had ridden the line that day. Several witnesses then came forward and claimed they had seen a woman resembling the 19-year-old in the East, Hampton, and Westfield areas of Massachusetts. They claimed she was wearing a yellow rain jacket. One week after Mount Tom was searched, numerous witnesses said they'd seen a young woman hiking in that area, which prompted the police to carry out another extensive search. On November 20th, a group of telephone linemen working on Whitting Peak near Mount Tom, reported that they'd been held at gunpoint by a young woman they believed to be Alice. 
Reportedly, she demanded food, which she ate ravenously before running off into the woods. The workers identified Alice via her photograph. Shortly after this, another man claimed she had accosted him, brandished a revolver, and told him to get out of the area. The winter caretaker at Mount Lebanon reportedly met Alice in the weeks following her disappearance. She asked him for a cup of coffee after coming from the direction of Pittsfield. She had reportedly walked nine miles and said she was on her way to Albany on foot. She had no suitcases and no further witnesses were found in the area. In early December, witnesses reported seeing a girl wearing a yellow slicker walking down the embankment towards Connecticut River in Hadley, Massachusetts, back on the day that Alice had vanished. Law enforcement linked this report with an earlier sighting of a yellow raincoat floating on the same stretch of river. However, the coat was never found. On December 13th, state police detective Joseph Daly said that he believed Alice had wandered away and was now dead. Police added that they were receiving many crank letters about the case. Several people claimed to know of or be Alice in the years following her vanishing. In March of 1926, a resident of Troy, New York, attempted twice to collect the reward being offered by James Corbett by claiming that a housemaid employed at his boarding house was the missing 19-year-old. A month later, a middle-aged woman turned herself into police, claiming to be Alice. And in May, a message in a bottle was retrieved from Connecticut River near Northampton. The letter was allegedly written by Alice and said that she was being held captive in caves near Smith's Ferry, a neighborhood in Holyoke. While law enforcement were not convinced the letter was real, they organized a search of the area anyway. Unfortunately, no trace of Alice was found. In 1933, a man from New York City confessed to killing Alice. He lived in Hadley at the time of her vanishing. However, he recanted his story following a police investigation and was ultimately dismissed as a suspect and his confession deemed to be false. Dozens of searches were carried out across urban areas, woodlands, and waterways in West Massachusetts, and they continued into the spring and summer months of 1926. In January of that same year, James Corbett enlisted the help of a boatman to search the Connecticut River. In July, various mills in and around Northampton were drained for annual maintenance, during which a search for Alice's remains was conducted. Yet again, this yielded no results. Two years after her disappearance, in October 1927, Search efforts of wilderness areas were renewed following the announcement of a $1,000 reward, the modern-day equivalent of over $15,000. In 1928, another student at Smith College disappeared. Francis Smith was last seen on January 13th. Just over a year later, in March of 1929, her body was recovered from Connecticut River near Longmeadow. Her cause of death does not appear to have been publicly released. Then in 1935, Etta Rail of Oxford, Massachusetts disappeared from Massachusetts Teachers College, where she was studying. In 1946, Paula Jean Weldon vanished from Bennington College in the nearby state of Vermont. And a year later, 19-year-old Anne Straw disappeared one summer night from New Hampshire. All of these cases were thought at some point to be linked, and also linked to Alice's disappearance. However, no concrete connection has ever been made between the young women. Anne Straw was found dead in August of 1948, her body in the Little Squam Lake. She was still dressed in her pajamas, leading to the belief that she took her own life. Despite all of the search efforts in Alice's case, she has never been found. Several news reports at the time stated that her classmates and friends noted that she was not in good spirits at the time of her vanishing. Although few theories are available, it has been speculated, as we mentioned earlier, that the 19-year-old was affected by the illuminating gas, that the shock of her friend's death led to some sort of mental break, or that she was already suffering from mental health issues, as indicated by the letter she left behind 
and her request for poison. Human bones located in a shallow grave in Northampton in 1936 were suspected of belonging to the missing student, but they were later identified as belonging to a Native American woman. 96 years have passed since Alice was last seen. It sadly seems unlikely we will ever truly know what happened. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for as little as $2 a month. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.